is. Okay, I'm going to call to order uh, the closed session opening ceremony. And seeing that there's no speakers uh, to any of the items tonight, we will now adjourn to closed session where we will be discussing item 2.1, two certificated employee appoint appointments. Item 2.2, classified public employee appointment and item 2.3 public employee discipline dismissals release and leaves item 2.6 real property negotiations and that's it um, welcome everyone to tonight's meeting um, just a couple of reminders, if you wish to speak on an item on today's agenda, make sure that you fill out a speaker card prior to the agenda item in order to be allowed to speak. Uh, in addition to that, if you need translation services, we do have Virginia. She's on the uh, back corner back there. She can provide you with the equipment necessary. Bienvenidos a todos a nuestra Junta de Octubre 10. <clears throat> Les quiero recordar que si gustan hablar um, um, en uno de las de los temas que se van a cubrir hoy, que tienen que llenar una de las tarjetas antes de ese tema para que puedan um, comentar. Y para las personas que necesiten tra um, traducción, nuestra traductora uh, Virginia les puede dar el equipo necesario. Thank you. And now I would like to ask our student um, board representative to lead us into the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Rosalie. So now moving on to item 3.3, .3, superintendent comments. Yes, thank you. Well, your voice matters. We've contracted with Youth Truth to develop a survey for students, staff, and families to help us improve um, programs and systems. Staff has begun to take the survey, and this week we'll begin to promote student and family surveys. The survey is scheduled from October 15th through the 26th. Uh, we've sent out a peach jar flyer to all district families, and we will promote via social media as well. So, su voz importa. Hemos contratado con Youth Truth para desarrollar una encuesta para estudiantes, personal y familias para ayudarnos a mejorar los programas y sistemas. El personal ha comenzado a tomar la encuesta y esta semana comenzamos a mover las encuestas de estudiantes y familias. La encuesta está programada del 15 al 26 de octubre. Y hemos enviado un boletín por Peach a todas las familias del distrito para que podamos proveer también a través de las redes so um, sociales. Um, and we're asking principals to support this effort at their sites as best that they can uh, via social media, newsletters, so that we can get as much feedback as possible. So también estamos pidiendo a los directores de las escuelas para que apoyen este esfuerzo en sus escuelas para mejorar um, a través de las redes sociales, boletines informativos, para que podamos obtener la mejor cantidad de comentarios posibles. And on October 25th, we're going to bring back the team from all of our secondary schools to continue our work on our educational equity audit. Um, we look forward to moving forward all the steps on this key initiative. So el 25 de octubre vamos a traer al, al grupo de todas las escuelas secundarias para continuar trabajando en el auditorio de igualdad educativo y esperamos de seguir adelante con todas las acciones con esta iniciativa clave. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. More comments? Jeff? Uh, last, or a week and a half ago now, and now, Kim DeSerpa, Trustee DeSerpa, Trustee DeRose, and I all got the chance to go to the Aptos homecoming game. And we had the even bigger honor of having, for the first time in over 10 years, an, a, t a band play that was made up of our local students. This, this board uh, has been very 
has really been, how do I say this, has been really focused on bringing arts back to the schools because we really feel, I speak for the board, but I think you all agree with me, that the arts really do play a pivotal role in helping, helping our students in their education. So it really was a thrill um, to see money go to such good use. I know, the I know the students liked it. I really know the parents liked it because I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> it was a great time. And so Aptos High, I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as the other ones. It was kind of cool, huh? Haven't had a band there in a long time. So I want to thank the board. I want, I want to thank Aptos High, and I believe Cesar Chavez has some students there for a great event. I'm, I'm looking forward to many more years of that type of success. Thank you. Anyone else? Kim? Um, not this last weekend, but the weekend before, I attended an event over in Salinas um, for COPA, which is um, communities organized for our political action. Um, our superintendent was um, a featured speaker that day. And how many people, Michelle, do you think were there? Probably like 500 or more. 600 people were there, all from different parishes. This is a faith-based group that brings together parishes from, um, from the Tri-County area. And so each parish had multiple people there. So there was like 600 people there that were all organized to um, to advocate for very important initiatives that are on the ballot this November um, to help people that are homeless, to help veterans, to um, advocate for mental health services. Um, what else? Education. Yeah, I said housing. Yeah, it was a very progressive agenda. I'll put it that way. And um, I was very pleased that Dr. Rodriguez was there among, ve uh, among every other elected dignitary who took the stage and um, were able to speak. And I was very proud to be there representing Pajaro Valley Unified. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, just really briefly, I would like to thank um, PBFG for the invitation to attend their last week's reception. They hosted, <coughs> excuse me, Tony Thurmond. It was great to be in a room full of candidates, elected officials, um, and of course, educators in our unions. Um, also, our governor just signed AB 2514, which establishes the Pathways to Success Incentive Program in support of the expansion of dual immersion programs. So the three-year program will award a grant of up to, or grant funding up to $300,000 to school districts or COEs. So granted that we, uh, we're currently trying to expand uh, the dual diversion program at Freedom Elementary School, I wanna make sure that our grant writer is already looking into um, that additional funding that we can possibly get. And um, I also wanna mention that our board president couldn't be here tonight. She's actually at a conference, it's work related. And so she wanted me to relay that information to all of you. Karen? So I always, I always, I, I, I went to the um, AFT Tony Thurman event as well. It was really great to be, it was pretty crowded. Lots of people were there and um, he spoke really well about the things that he's accomplished for education as an assembly member, which I was pretty impressed about. Um, so and I feel good about him. Also, I went to a daycare rally for, um, in the plaza um, just a f couple of days ago um, for daycare workers and their fight for better wages and better um, support for themselves and parents. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. Okay, under item 3.5, high school student board representatives. Do we have anyone from Pajaro Valley High School? We're, we'll go ahead and get started with you. Good evening, President. Um, good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and fellow board members. My name is Daniel Rocha, and I represent Pajaro Valley High School. Uh, the start of this month and the last couple of weeks of September have been quite busy for our school academics. The counseling department has worked very hard to make sure that the sophomore class is prepared for the PSCT, which has been taking place this week. Um, also, our academic counselors have been meeting every day with the senior class 
to update their college and um, college and career path, and also make sure that they're on the right path to graduation. And the College Center has offered various workshops to help seniors apply to colleges and do their FAST applications, and they stay after school up to sometimes 6.30 or even 7.30 every Monday and Tuesday. Um, our athletics, two weeks ago, our girls volleyball team played against Watsumo High School and beat them in a five-set match. For the first time, they beat them in their, host, in their house. Um, they are currently in third place in the league with even two losses. Um, Philippa had a game this Saturday, and they came short two points. They are extremely determined to possibly be the best team in the league. Um, and our boys and girls soccer team, as well as our basketball teams, have, been, have started their conditioning programs to make sure that they are fit. Um, our activities, ASB planned the first ever pink out games for football and volleyball, and we had over, I think, 85 people attend both games, um, those being students. Um, it was extremely amazing, and it was high energy. Uh, we also had a club rush, which was a huge success, and the feminist club actually got over I think, 75 people signed up for the club. Um, and then just yesterday we had our leadership conference and that was extremely amazing. We showcased um, our amazing school spirit and most importantly we learned to be amazing leaders for our school. Thank you. Thank you. Watsonville High School. Do we have Watsonville High School here tonight? Renaissance? My name is Denise Gonzalez. I'm a senior at Renaissance. I've been at Renaissance for two years now. Renaissance has helped me and a lot of high school students in some extraordinary ways, and some are um, in recovering credits, but not just that. Right now, we are celebrating something really important, is that our daily attendance is at a 90% right now, so that's very good. <laughs> um, students prior to attending RHS, their attendance increased by like a 60%, so that's pretty good. Um, Renaissance is not just focused on recovering um, credits, it's also um, offering many electives and after school opportunities, for example, commercial art, digital design and 3D printing, computer science, AG science, woodshop, digital media arts, volleyball, basketball, soccer, girls club and ping pong. All these activities make Renaissance High School a fantastic place to get motivated. Um, it also it, it's also a good place for hands-on learning projects like garden project, aquaphonics and greenhouse project, electrical theory and practice, solar energy, energy theory and practice, digital design and 3D printing. Also, we're dealing with um, some concerns and challenges like rise in depression among some students and substance abuse to combat depression. And for those things and response, we have support like increase in counseling services, prevention, education in all classes, personalized solutions to engagement, and we're also increasing career and technical education. When students have a plan for college or know they could be successful, they are less likely to consume alcohol and drugs. Renaissance High is at its best and yet trying to get better. Thank you. Thank you again for having us here. Um, lately at Aptos High, we have had a lot of um, colleges coming into the College and Career Center and talking to the students and helping them um, start applying to colleges and getting interested. Uh, it's that time of year again when Aptos High is hosting the PSAT for every sophomore junior to help them prepare for the test. Our first college week is coming up on October 22nd through the 26th. Mariners will be uh, participating in activities and same with the staff. Um, so for arts, our choir presented their annual coffee house concert on October 6th and uh, the choir did a really good job performing and they had a lot of fun doing it. Um, the ceramics classes are putting on their annual empty bowls fundraiser fundraiser where um, bulls that the students made will be auctioned off to people 
and helped to um, serve soup to those in need. Um, and the theater is continuing preparations for their fall musical, The Adams Family. And opening night is Saturday, October 27th. So for activities, we had a successful homecoming week uh, two weeks ago, and the seniors took the class cup. Our community service fair will be coming up soon, so students can discover places to volunteer to get community service hours, because every student at Plus High needs 40 hours in order to graduate. Students who are in sports or in activity are currently selling drive for school tickets to the community. When someone buys a ticket, they have a chance to win a car or $25,000 in cash. For every ticket a student sells, all funds go to their program. And our football game is currently still undefeated. And two weeks ago at our homecoming game, our band performed for the first time. Our girls volleyball team is currently five and two in league and we are continuing to go strong. And then um, our boys and girls water polo team are doing well and our girls are overall 11 and four. And our tennis and cross country teams are both doing well. Our cross country team, um, both boys and girls ranked high in their Stanford Invitational. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So for our board representatives present, um, you're welcome to stick around for the entire meeting, but we understand that you do have homework, so feel free uh, to leave early if you have to. So item 3.6, um, student recognitions. And I would like to call up Patricia Jasmine Martinez Barrera and her family along with anyone else who's here to support her. Good evening, board. Uh, good evening, uh, Vice President Orozco, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez. It's an honor, a pleasure to be here this evening. I know it's a yearly event, and I still get a little nervous and um, excited about our students. This year, we have selected Patricia Martinez as our student of the year. Um, <laughs> it's a little nervous, um, and. Um, her amazing teacher, Mr. Miller, his second year at Freedom Elementary, would like to address the board. Thank you, good evening. Real nervous too, but um, I'm honored to be here and I'm, it's a pleasure to be here and it's a real pleasure and honor to present Patricio Martinez this evening as student of the year at Freedom Elementary uh, she's made tremendous strides in all academic areas this year, a huge jump. Um, that's really amazing that I see every day. So obviously I'm really impressed with that, but I think one thing that I'm really impressed with is her character and the development of that over the course of the last year and this year that I've known her and have been her teacher. So I see a great deal of empathy. Um, in fact, my class this year really has a lot of empathy going on and just caring and people coming together and helping each other. But she's definitely a superstar in room 12. And um, I think we owe a lot of that to her being a member of room 12. So I'm going to make this real short, but um, again, I'm, I'm really honored I'm honored to have her here. I'm honored to have her in my class. I want to thank her family for being here tonight. I know it wasn't easy to be here. I know you're nervous. I'm nervous too. But uh, she's very deserving of this honor, very deserving of this honor. So thank you. Thank you very much.
behalf of the Power Valley Unified School District, I want to present you with this certificate of recognition, uh, recognizing your hard work, your per perseverance, and from what I was reading on that description, your leadership and compassion towards others. So very much deserving awards and congratulations. Y muchísimas sí, felicidades a ustedes. Yo se la tomo, mijo. Yo se la tomo para que salgas en la foto. Just bear with me, I'm logging back into my laptop here. <laughs> um, so next up, I would like to call up um, Denise Adilene Gonzalez from Renaissance High School. And everyone who's here for the Porter, please. Dana Richards, I'm Denise's principal at Renaissance High School, and I'm so excited to see her and her family here tonight. Um, Denise is authentic, she's compassionate, she exemplifies what Renaissance is about, a second chance, a rebirth. She's engaged, she's a bright light in my day when I see her and get a chance to talk to her. She's respectful of every student at our school and embraces the diversity that rep that Renaissance represents in a really deep way. Every time I hear her speak publicly, I'm moved by how sincere and how she comes from her personal experience in a deep way. So um, I'm pleased that the board is recognizing her leadership traits and her exceptional humanity here tonight. So this is Denise. Well, I'm really thankful because you guys acknowledged what I, my experiences at Renaissance and I've, what I'm here for today. I want to thank my principal and my family for being here, and thank you so much. So before we continue, congratulations again. Before we continue to the next item, um, Willie, your hero, has a comment to share with us. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, the other afternoon, uh, Leslie and I went to a meeting of the soccer, of United Soccer, 
and the uh, principal of Freedom School was there. And we are, and I just wanted everybody to know that we're working hard to get Freedom Elementary the soccer field th that they need. And at the same time, I I uh, wanted to want to just take this moment to r recognize uh, Maria, who is the president of the board, who went to Freedom Elementary School, who was uh, probably up there when she was little. So, Maria, thank you very much. So moving right along, item 4.0, approval of the agenda. I am looking for a motion. Let's so move approval. Can we get a second? second? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, motion carries 511. 502. Five, zero, Thank you. So um, item 5.0, approval of the minutes for... Um, the September 26, 2018 meeting. I move approval of our meeting minutes for October 3rd, 2018. Can we get a second? second. There's also um, one with a, a slight modification. So Francisco mm -hmm. Rodriguez, PVFT president, um, spoke to us in regards to measure H, not measure A. So just a, a minor typo there. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries 5012. Abstain. And one abstention. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Michelle. So, item 5.2 approval of the October um, 3rd, 2018 mini minutes. Yeah. Maria? Yes. I need to um, correct the record. So my motion was to approve the October 3rd meeting minutes, and that's what I thought we just did. So I think I don't know how to fix what, we're, what we need to do now, because that's what I actually said, is to approve the October 3rd minutes. Could we go back? Yeah, let's go back then. So for item can I go back to item 5.1 and move approval for September 26, 2018 minutes? With the modification? With indicated. the modification, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry about that. And Karen, can you second that again? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Motion carries. All right. Item 5.2. And one abstention. Thank you. Okay. And then for item 5.2, I also approve the minutes of the October 3rd meeting. Okay. Can we get a second? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Abstain. And one abstention. So it's 5. Thank you. All right. So item 6.1 public comment. So I know we do have one speaker. We do have one speaker here uh, tonight. Uh, how do I read this? Uh, Mr. Bill Beecher. How do I read this? <laughs> so, Bill, um, I will be using I will be using my phone to time you. So, once you hear the alarm, your time's up. Just don't call me. Uh, recently, I gave you uh, I shared some tales from the campaign trails to give you a little uh, levity. Well, tonight I want to go back and share some more tales from the trails. But it's a uh, feedback that I've gotten from talking to an awful lot of uh, constituents and it's about math and math performance. The parents aren't happy this Aptos High School. I'm not happy and I've spoken about this in the past and you should be unhappy. You've heard how hard it is to recruit math teachers. Well let me share with you some recent data the top 10% of the mathematicians make over 160 k a year. The median salary for a mathematician is 106. And the bottom 10% make a little under 55,000. And you go, how the heck can we recruit math teachers when they're going to be paid at the bottom of what a mathematician is going to be paid? And what's driving the salaries for mathematicians? Well, we've all heard about big data. Well, that's what's driving the mathematicians. They need people who can analyze this data 
and make sense of it. And it doesn't matter whether it's IBM or it's Wall Street or just think tanks. And it's one of the fastest growing job areas in the country, which is going to make the situation of hiring math, math teachers even tougher. So what can we do? Well, you could raise the pay of our math teachers to attract better teachers. But what about the poor performing math teachers that we have now? Then how can you do this with your row and column system that you have in place? Well, we could go to master teachers who teach using satellite sites where you have one teacher teaching to the three high schools. Um, I experienced that when I was at HP. I took classes from Stanford while I was at HP. Well, there's an individual in my district who's willing to help fund doing that kind of a program. Bottom line is there's no easy answers on how we do a better job of teaching math. So I'd like to see a study session done on this topic where we sit down and say, what are the alternatives? What are the approaches? What can we do? And I'd like to see PVFT and the high school math teachers attend and provide some new and constructive thinking because what we're doing isn't working. And to use the old Einstein quote, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is insanity. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Do we have any other speakers? Okay. Under item 7.0, employee organization comments, do we have PVFT? Thank you, Francisco Rodriguez um, with uh, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers, uh, President. Um, so just wanted to, to let you know earlier today we submitted a um, request for information with regards to uh, information that we need to begin with our negotiations. As you are all aware, our uh, contract that uh, we came to an agreement with uh, um, is up to January, I'm sorry, June 2019, not January. But <laughs> um, and uh, we would like to um, be able to resolve our contract negotiations uh, well before that date. Um, our last session in negotiations took us over 18 months, um, and that's highly unusual for most districts in uh, California. Uh, not that it's not okay to be unusual, but um, I think this one is something that we want to be, uh, you know, more like everybody else and uh, come to an agreement. Um, I think that uh, at this time, the district and uh, the union uh, have realized that uh, there are uh, various ways in which we can uh, see agreements on um, contracts and other uh, areas. And to that end, uh, I think that uh, we're working towards that. Um, and so we're, we are you know, open to uh, listening and uh, working in all capacities. Uh, as far as uh, the previous comments, uh, when it comes to uh, salary schedules, I don't know if you're aware or not, or if the speaker is aware that uh, they are ruled through uh, Ed Code, and that prior to those regulations, uh, if you happen to email, you happen to be paid less, regardless of your experience. Um, and regardless of the subject that you taught. Uh, and the current schedules address those types of uh, issues that we had in the past. And that's how we end up with the type of schedule that we have where you are paid based on your experience, based on your education. And in addition, there's Ed Code that deals with uh, underperforming teachers and how to uh, ensure that they receive the appropriate support or are terminated. Um, and so when it comes to terminating a teacher, don't believe that it's impossible. It's actually very easy. Um, and it needs, there needs to be, um, obviously, to, um, everybody about uh, those sections of Ed Code. Uh, so that we don't have uh, erroneous comments being made uh, to you or uh, to candidates or to anyone in the public. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. <coughs> All right, item 7.2, um, 
the SEA. Kabam. CWA. Okay. So. So now moving on to item to action items. Item 8.1, we have Alex subscription for mathematics. And this report will be given by Susan Perez, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. I'm not turning green. Evening, Vice President Orozco, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, we, with regards to Alex, we are making um, an effort this year. Um, we actually did this last year as well on more of a pilot scale to provide additional support at the middle school level, especially around mathematics achievement. Um, Alex is a digital program that we piloted last year at uh, several middle schools to be able to really differentiate instruction, supporting students who are both struggling in mathematics as well as providing instruction to students who were accelerated. Um, Alex is a mathematics, provides courses, and we're using the mathematics courses um, and through assessment and determining exactly where students are at, providing additional courses at the middle school level um, to help support students in mathematics using this program. So utilize both for st identified struggling students, um, identifying that through assessment, and then also being utilized for some of our high achieving students to allow them to accelerate um, in and stay at the level of challenge that they should be in mathematics. So we are requesting your approval um, for the purchase of the Alex licenses. So we don't have any speakers to this item. or comments? Kim? Hi. Hello. <laughs> so Susan Perez, what are some of the outcomes so far in the piloted um, programs that we've been? Last year when we piloted Alex, the outcomes were very good, both for struggling students as well as our accelerated students. That's one of the reasons we wanted to continue and expand that this year. Can you say a little bit more about what that means, really? Um, we saw growth in their mathematics achievement um, based on their MAP scores. That, that's what we were monitoring. As well as, the, this is, a, whoop, excuse me, it's computer adaptive, so it has its own assessments built in, mm -hmm. but we also monitored the MAP scores for these students. And did you get any feedback from the students the about students how they like it? The students love it. They love it. The students love it. Mm -hmm. And when our accelerated student, we actually started with our accelerated students, and they really loved it. I was hesitant to use it with our struggling students, but we did decide to try, and they loved it as well mm -hmm. and did very well with it. Can you say a little bit about um, wh how the teachers feel about it? Because I'm guessing it mm -hmm. sort of takes away some of the actual instruction. Um, but well, it's being used differently at different schools. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, I've been a number of times in the classroom at Aptus Junior where it was being used. And it was almost, um, it reminded me of when I was in a, a class at um, one of the high schools where the students were doing work inside and outside of class. The teacher was rotating. And because the students were doing lessons online, the teacher was freed up to really be moving around and answering questions and having in-depth conversations with students. It was like they were working almost like a flipped classroom where they were reading outside of class and then coming to class and doing the work when the teacher was there to support them and, and working in groups with other students. It was, it's impressive to watch. It's outstanding. Thank you. You're welcome. For supporting this. Anyone else? Karen? I was just going to say, so, so a program like this can do it so that you assess them, but the program can also assess where they're at 
and then move them exactly where they're at and then know when they can move them a little bit forward or have them redo what they're doing so they can get it and then move forward? Is That's what a computer pro adaptive program does, yes. Uh -huh. So it, it kind of, but it knows, knows where they're at and knows how to work with them where they're at and then if they do get figured out, they can Yes, and what? Or, 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 they can d or they can redo it if they still are struggling or something. Yes, yeah. uh -huh. and they're in classrooms where they're getting support from teachers as well. Yeah. And Alex offers full courses, so that, that's one of the really nice things. We know they're getting the standards that they need to address. And, and I, I suppose it's probably, it's probably in line with the standards that we already have. Absolutely. And all that kind of stuff, yeah. Uh -huh. So just, just to give you some hard data, um, Kim, so that you kind of see the difference. So at PMS, um, we, what we're doing, we did a large um, scale pilot at, at PMS. And what we did is we looked at um, the students that are coming into the grade levels and how they are performing at a better level this year than they were the previous year. And so the average, um, so it is an average, but the average PMS student is coming in at 3.1 points higher than they did the previous year. So if you translate that, that's a little bit under half of a year. So we may, we have students coming into seventh grade math at a half of a year higher than they had the previous year um, by going into the program. Um, and so we do feel um, also, I just wanted to note that eighth grade was our largest bump in SBAC scores, and that's where we focused um, our math instruction, um, both through the math lab at Aptos Junior and also the pilots that were occurring. I think the most important for me is, um, is to address equity issues. So two years ago, only if you were only in the North Zone, did you have the ability to accelerate um, because we didn't have enough students, you know, we couldn't put give a teacher for two students, three students. And so if you didn't go, if you weren't at Aptos Junior, you didn't have that choice. Now we have this very year, we have kids from Rolling Hills, Cesar Chavez, EA Hall, all of them, right? At Lakeview. Um, um, did I miss one? I'm I did, um, they'll call me later, um, is, um, is they, they are all now, if you meet the criteria, we have a set criteria, if you meet that criteria, and you now and go into that accelerated course, regardless of the school that you're in. Um, and so that's very important to Susan and I because it was a major equity issue prior. Anyone else? <coughs> yes, Maria. Willie. Uh, uh, Susan, the uh, price for this is uh, $9,332. How does that work? Is that for just for one school? or the No, that's for all the middle schools that we're using at. at. And so that's an annual fee? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so, that, so, that, so that we're, uh, we're, we're actually going to get a program for all of the students in math throughout the school district for... This is at the middle school level. That's the cost for having it in grades six, seventh, and eighth. Wow, that sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Not bad at all. Uh, at this, I'm sorry. Kim, at the schools that don't, that have sixth grade, like the elementaries with a sixth grade, or can we have it there too? Okay. <laughs> all sixth graders in the district. Well, not all sixth graders are using it. We've identified specific students based on data. But yes, it is available to all schools that have sixth grade through eighth grade. Any other comments? Now I am looking for a motion to approve this item. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 601. I'm the next one, so I'll just stay. All right, item 8.2, approve a cheap 3,000 proposal. Okay, thank you. This is another pilot that we started last year and um, are moving on, recommending that we uh, expand this this year. Um, we have in recent years placed a huge emphasis on literacy in our district and really um, 
have made great efforts in the primary grades around reading foundational skills with our SIPs reboot and a lot of the work we're doing in grades K through 2. But we also want to make sure that we are supporting our secondary students in reading as well. So we um, began working with the freshmen or the English teachers, English 1 teachers at Watsonville High School last year um, to really learn how to differentiate their English classes to better meet the needs of students in class, especially around their reading needs. Because as the students get older, um, if students are struggling, that gap widens. And by the secondary level, you can have students with quite a broad range um, in terms of their reading ability. And so um, in the work we're doing with Watsonville High School teachers, um, they are learning how to differentiate their classrooms by setting up small groups and rotating students through differentiated stations and really meeting their, their, the needs um, based on, again, monitoring data, doing those um, interim assessments, um, the formative assessments to determine what the students' needs are. And one of we are recommending um, the purchase of Achieve 3000, which is another um, computer adaptive program that um, targets students' reading so that students in one of the rotations, um, they're on a program that differentiates the grade level reading but at their reading level so that every student can participate in discussions that are going on in the class and activities through the same content but differentiated to their reading level and pushing them to the next reading level. So um, we started with just a few classrooms last year and we want to um, expand this to the full freshman class and work with all of the English 1 teachers this year and are asking for you to approve the um, Achieve 3000 licenses um, for us to do this work this year with Watsonville High School. Thank you, Susan. We do not have any speakers to this item, so I'll bring it back for board comments. No questions? Anyone? I have a quick question for you. Is, is this um, something that special ed students um, can access? At least those students who are in less restrictive environments? Yes. Great. Thank you. Karen? Is it specially adapted also for English language learners? Because it sounds like it's got an English language learner. I mean, is it, I don't know if it's adapted for English language learners, but is it, <laughs> um, can it, well, <laughs> I don't know how to say this, but is it, is it adapted in such a way that it's very beneficial for English language learners or something? <laughs> it, it adapts to students' reading levels. It continually assesses where they're at and addresses their specific skills. But I really want to point out this is used in part of a classroom environment. It's not the sole instruction. Yeah. So the teachers, are what we're working with are the teachers also making sure that um, the other rotations that they have in the classroom are also supporting the instruction so the students getting reinforcement they're getting that reading they're doing independent work with a group and really learning the collaborative skills and then having time with a teacher targeting skills as well so in that combination yes it can meet the needs of English learners okay. anyone else okay I'm looking for a motion I have, oh, sorry, one more question. Did you discuss the um, the pilot outcomes? Like, how are we doing with the current pilot of this? Um, in terms of the data, we only used it with a couple of classrooms last year, and we did see some growth, but we didn't get the rotation in place. Last year, all we did was pilot actually using this program, um, and it we this is a secondary version of a program we've used at elementary um, with great success and they um, they did see improvement in the reading but we really want it we, we're doing this so that it's part of this rotation because that's where the power is in that differentiation and the multiple ways that students are learning in the classroom so at as of this year we haven't we're just beginning it so we don't have data yet on this year 
Um, so last year, just to, rem to remind the board, um, Watsonville High School, this was just with the ninth graders, so it's not reflected in the eighth grade SBAC scores. So I do want to make that point because it was the ninth graders. Um, they were the ones that um, won the national award for making one of the most progresses in, in the district. We did, and I'm sorry, so Susan may not get this email. I, I demand them to give me monthly responses. So um, they did this this very month. We had 96% of those students um, completed their level set um, to be on target to make two years worth of growth. Um, so 96, so we only had 4%. And we had a total of 722 um, logins. Um, and so we have all of our students that have logged That's in great. and are ready to go. Um, so um, we feel really strongly that um, we'll continue to see growth and it will, in several years, it will translate to the 11th grade SBAC scores once they're 11th graders. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to make a motion to approve. Can we get a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Try motion carries 601. Good for you. Thank you, Susan. Okay, item 8.3, approve, ap uh, I'm sorry, yes, approve appointment of teachers on professional internship permits. Thank Trina. you, Vice President Orozco, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, there's still a significant shortage of teachers nationwide, and although our district team uh, assertively engages in a myriad of recruitment activities, the shortages of appropriately credentialed teachers still exist. And similar to other districts, we're submitting for review and approval by our board trustees uh, two applications for provisional intern permits to meet our teacher needs, which comply with the requirements of the uh, Commission on Teacher Credentialing. And as championed by our board trustees and um, PBFT, uh, these two teachers will have mentors from our experienced PBUSD teachers in addition to support from their admin. And the two teachers are Connor O'Brien, and he is already in a preliminary um, credential program at Brandman University and English at Aptos High. He received a bachelor's degree from UC Santa Cruz and a master's from the University of Edinburgh. And the other teacher is Genesis Politron uh, for uh, SELPA, um, and we have a big shortage for deaf and hard of hearing teachers. Um, she d uh, received a bachelor's from Sacramento State in deaf uh, studies in American Sign Language, as well as a minor in child development and French. Um, she has experience working as a substitute, working with uh, deaf and hard of hearing students. Thank you, Chona. So we do not have any speakers to this item, so I'll bring it back to the board for questions. Kim? No? Okay. Anyone else? All right. I can make a motion to approve. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 601. So item 8.4, MOU with Santa Cruz County Office of Ed uh, regarding the implementation of SCAPE technology financial system and the report will be given by um, Joe, our CBO. So good evening. Uh, this uh, item uh, through the Santa Cruz County Office of Education provided an RFP for a new financial software in our districts throughout our county. And um, several firms responded to the RFP and through the uh, selection process, which included uh, interview panel presentations uh, of the vendors and also site visits of districts um, that are currently using uh, Escape. And based on the feedback from the various working groups, which was very thorough and representation um, from HR uh, to payroll, to purchasing, and other um, uh, departments within districts throughout the county, uh, ESCAPE was uh, selected through the process. Uh, so attached this evening is the um, agreement of the MOU with our County Office of Education, um, and it covers the implementation. Um, we are trying to do a very thorough um, transition uh, timeline and so HR and payroll will be the first portion uh, with the expectation of July 1, 2019. And then uh, shortly thereafter, then our other departments will transition through. Uh, this will help us approving this agreement this evening. 
will help us put in place some of the professional development and training because it is going to be a, a, a process to transition from our current software to escape. Um, one of the components that we do uh, uh, really enjoy from the system was the position control component and then the dashboard, which it really enhances our fiscal transparency for departmental budgets, but also transparency to our community. Thank you, Joe. We do not have any speakers. Do we have board comments or questions? I have one. Yes. Um, so when I was looking at the cost, it seemed to me that our contribution was significantly higher than the rest. And I'm wondering why that's the case. Is it because we're just a larger district? Okay. Got it. So correct. It's the, the size of our district, our RADA and the, um, the components within um, the size and overall are our fair share based on that. Got it, thank you. You're welcome. So I am looking for a motion. Can I make a motion? We'll we second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries, 601. Thank you. Item 8.5, approve um, use of bond management consultant. And again, this is a report by Joe Dominguez. So here this evening we have um, a scope of work uh, totaling uh, $69,940. And in your attachment, it's a, a review and assessment and an analysis of our, our facilities bond program. Uh, and within that is reviewing our current uh, software and uh, projects, uh, scope of work, and uh, overview uh, entirely of our uh, district systems and streamlining of our projects. The other uh, component that uh, coming corporation, not only just the analysis or review of the department, but also to assist the district in negotiations for uh, PV uh, high school uh, football field project and uh, finalizing uh, negotiations and selection of, of uh, contractors or enhancing our pool of contractors. Um, also included is reviewing in partnership with our procurement department is growing our pool of architectural contractors and or additional consultants such as engineers or uh, other type of facility consultants. So to enhance the uh, pool and also price and get a better pricing of the firms that we use as a district. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Uh, there's no speakers to this item. Does the board have any questions or comments? Willie. Thank you. Uh, Joe, what, um, uh, moving ahead with the, with the athletic field project, any other consultants, folks that we need to get this thing rolling? Where are we as to the timeline? For uh, PV High School, uh, is that the one you're, the question was? Yes. Okay, so for PV High, we are currently in the process of it doing a, um, uh, constructability review so the contractor Kent construction is now reviewing our plans our architectural plans the scope and reviewing the timeline uh, from their perspective and so right now they're looking and doing an assessment on all the components of the project with the district we have in that process we have a, a follow-up meetings with both the contractor and the district team to go through those items and review um, it's really their opportunity to review and assess, um, kind of lock in their estimates from their perspective, and then the next step of negotiations. As we previously discussed, it was um, the previous agenda item for Kent Construction was to approve the contractual agreement to move forward. Now the second part of negotiations is timeline and cost. And so that's where we're at right now regarding the football field project. Right, right. but, but but how did the lease leaseback contractor bid on all this stuff without knowing what the what the actual cost design architectural features were isn't it like reverse shouldn't shouldn't all this stuff been done first and then we go back out for the lease leaseback how does this work together so in the previous presentation a lease leaseback is allows us to provide it's a different model. So in traditional design bid build, where that's the 
you do a hard bid. Mm -hmm. And so it's open up to all contractors. They submit a price, and that price is the price. A lease leaseback delivery method gives us an opportunity to select a quality set uh, pool of contractors, and then based on experience, uh, scope, the size of their company, um, the background, and more of the details specific to uh, a specific project, that's how a firm selected. Then they go out to bid and work on with their subcontractors in the project. It's different a lease lease back as that they're a developer in terms, a partner with the district. So the the bids are actually open and transparent to the district. And the traditional uh, hard bid method, the bids are sealed, and the district only sees them as the bid on the end of bid day. I know, but but Joe, if if the um, art if the architectural designs come back different or what we we had not expected and we have a we have the lease back lease lease back with the set amount is there any chance of we're, that the school district will be left holding the bag at you know at the end where where, where there's not enough money to so this is a great opportunity i think one of the strengths of this delivery method is that we get to work it out or hash it out and look at the design plans, the DSA approved plan set, and say, uh, you have, for example, and just in layman's terms, you have a water line running 100 yards um, and it's zigzagging and going around this section of building. What would be the cost savings if we went from point A to point B and ran the water line a specific way? And I'm using that as an example. But those are the discussions that are going to go on with the contractor, the architect, and the district team. And so that's what we're finalizing right now. We are hoping that we can provide an additional cost savings based on what the estimates that the architect is providing, Kent Construction. Um, so we're going to work as a team to keep costs within um, budget and agree if it's over budget what that dollar amount is so that as a team we can figure out how to get there. So it would be ultimately beneficial and possibly reduce um, the amount of money that we're currently spending in change orders? Correct. And so one of the other uh, positive uh, pieces of having a developer with like Kent Construction uh, in the front end within a lease lease back is it helps um, in the construction delivery method is address costs on the front end and know up front rather than it being a surprise six months or ten months down the road. We catch it on the front end and we plan accordingly. Great, thank you. Do we have any other comments? Karen? I don't know if this is a big deal, but um, <coughs> so so I know the builder, or whatever his name is, builder, um, is he's selecting, he's gonna be in charge of selecting the subcontractors and he brings them back to us to check on, or is this person that you're, this coming construction management, are they going to look at these subcontractors and figure out what the best ones are, what the best price is, but also the best kind of subcontractors? Are, are they going to do that too? So the coming corporation will assist us in recruiting and getting the word out to build our pool of contractors and or consultants that are needed for uh, projects throughout. But the specific to PV High, yes, they would assist in that. And then, as I mentioned, in the lease lease back uh, delivery method, the bids will be open and transparent to the district. So we'll get to see um, very clearly which ones are the low bids of the various contractors and or the quality uh, of that firm. And the quality, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Thank you. Kim? Hi, Joe. Yeah. Good evening. Have you, um, have you worked with Cumming before? Yes, they yeah. have a good experience. Uh, yeah. They have, um, I worked with them at Oakland Unified, and they assisted Oakland Unified uh, in approximately about the $400 uh, million dollar bond project. Wow. Um, and they definitely assisted in, the, um, we had a lease lease back delivery method and we had a traditional design bid build. Um, and there was projects that were already over budget prior to my tenure, and they assisted me getting back some of the projects back in alignment. And I had five different construction firms at Oakland, and Cummings was one of those firms. Mm -hmm. So I also not only built an architectural pool, of, so instead of having one or two architects, we had like six architects, and we rotated the work around. Mm -hmm. 
So same with um, construction management firms is I had five firms mm -hmm. and we rotated the work throughout. That's great. And so is the is this scope of work that they do very common to these lease lease back projects or programs? The scope of work is very um, common uh, to get an assessment done on our bond program and kind of uh, do a, a total review of where we're at and how our projects are funded or if our, some of our projects are underfunded. And so really do the big picture and kind of take a look at saying, uh, what are we doing in year one, year two, and year three? And one of the things I really appreciate about this scope is they will be providing an anal analysis and a report, so findings and recommendations. So really get in within depth within the um, our program and, and make recommendations to the district what we need to adjust. And so this will, I feel, will be very helpful for us to move forward um, as we proceed. So um, one of, just one of the follow-up questions I have is that we've already sp expended most of the bond program. We only have, like, is, don't we only have a third of the money left? Like most of the projects are already completed with the exception of PV High and some other things that will be happening next summer, I guess, but. Correct, and we have, uh, we still have barely starting the third issuance. We have not touched that yet. Right. But that's one of the items that we really need to find out is what is the current amount that we have remaining and what are the amount of projects and do we have enough to finish so if there's say 50 projects do we have enough money within our bond program to finish the 50 and or how do we assess and prioritize that and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i think it's very critical to do a full big picture to make sure that we have enough and or mm -hmm. short term but also long term how do we position the district because the 2012 facility master plan showed that there was a bigger need of our facilities yes, than our bond that yeah. we passed. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like long term? Is that a new bond and when, et cetera? So that would also be um, part taken of it. In. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. This is an action item, so I am looking for a motion. Go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Six Okay, motion carries five, one, one. All right. So under uh, report and discussion items, we have item 9.1, California Public School Facility Bonds Initiative, COP Decision 51 Funding Eligibility Update. And this is also Joe.
All right. I'll start again. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Vice President, uh, Board Members, Superintendent. My name is Kevin Sullivan. Uh, I'm with uh, School Facility Pr Consultants. I am the Director of our Planning Services Division. If I can start, I'll just give you a little bit of brief background of our firm. Um, we've been helping districts in the K in the K-12 arena since 1986. Um, collectively, this, our staff has uh, assisted districts in obtaining hundreds of millions, quite frankly, billions of dollars um, of state school facility program money since 1998. Prop 51 is probably something that the district's aware of. Uh, it was passed in 2016. It, was, it sort of ended the drought of um, school facility funding and the school facility program. Um, we had a basically an eight-year uh, drought of, of state bond authority. The $9 billion total for K-12, it was a, a $12 billion bond, um, included $3 billion for community colleges. Of the $9 billion for K-12, it included $3 billion for new construction, $3 billion for modernization, and then $500 million for um, uh, each for career tech and um, charter. These two pie charts represent where we stay, stand currently as of the State Allocation Board meeting uh, at the end of last month. Uh, new construction money has been exhausted. There have been uh, applications received that exceed the uh, $3 billion um, for uh, new construction. For modernization, we have about $833, or $833 million left. Um, I can give you some good news. Um, we have projects under new construction uh, for Pajaro Valley that are um, on the list, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Brief overview of the new construction modernization program. New construction basically provides for new schools, new classrooms. Uh, modernization provides for the renovation and uh, sort of types of things that extend the useful life of the school building. The district has participated in the past in uh, the new construction program. You've built several new schools, including a new high school. Um, in the school facility program. Um, we've also had some modernization projects in the past. Uh, and as I said, uh, we've got two uh, new construction projects that are in uh, the Prop 51 pipeline. Uh, Valencia and Aptos Junior High School. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, eligibility for new construction and modernization. So new construction is a 50-50 program. The district provides 50% of the state funding and the state, or the 50% of the funding and the state provides a matching share. Um, what we do in order to determine eligibility is we look at an enrollment projection and we compare that to the number of classrooms that the district has available pursuant to the state's guidelines and regulations. When there's a delta that's a positive, then we have the ability to construct new classrooms. In some cases, unfortunately, there's a negative, and then in those cases, the state feels that we have sufficient capacity to house students that are enrolled. For modernization, we look at the age of a building, the age of a classroom facility. It has to be 25 or years or older for permanent and 20 years old or older for portable. And that program is a 60-40 match. So 60% of the funding will come from the state. The district would match with a 40% um, contribution. It's reimbursable. So we're currently working with staff to look back to um, projects the district already completed in order to file applications. The funding process is a little bit convoluted, <laughs> and I'll talk about that right now. Um, new construction and modernization is the first step. We've completed that. Um, I think uh, Joe may have handed out some documents, and there's a slide that we'll get to in a second that outlines what we believe the eligibility is for the district, both for modernization and new construction. The next step is to obtain any required DSA or CDE approvals for the work that we're proposing to file with OPSC. The agency that reviews the uh, applications in, on behalf of the State Allocation Board. Once we have those approvals in place, we will prepare the applications, or assist the district with preparing the application documents for submittal to Office of Public School Construction. It then, unfortunately, just based on where we are, um, with a backlog of projects that have accumulated since the end of the um, Prop 1D bond and the beginning of the Prop 51 bond, is we kind of go into a holding pattern as we wait for OPSC to review the application. Once the application has been reviewed, it's then passed on to the State Allocation Board for an apportionment, and then the district can move forward with filing a fund release. And at, depending on where we are or where we've decided to go as a, as a, as a district, we're either going to be reimbursing work we've already done or we'll have the state money that we need to move forward with, an app, with the construction. 
we have to be careful. New construction, we want to file that uh, before we occupy the building. That's why we got the Aptos and Valencia project submitted. And then modernization, again, like I said, we're going to be looking for, um, for a project that we can file because we can go all the way back to 1998 if, um, if we meet all of the required criteria. So this uh, slide shows what we believe the eligibility for modernization is at our elementary sites. Collectively, we're seeing that there's upwards of $27 million that could be filed um, for, uh, for project scope there. So like Kevin mentioned, we have to go back in time, uh, as far back as 98, to kind of see what projects were completed by the various sites that we can go back and get reimbursed for. And so to get eligible for the modernization, we can go back in time and see what Karen? Yeah, so, yeah, what you're looking at there is the uh, is our estimated modernization eligibility under 2017-18 CBETS um, for each of the uh, campuses in the district. And so um, there should be numbers there next to each of the campuses. Um, if there's a zero, then it means that that campus um, isn't old enough at this point. The, the buildings are not yet 25 or 20 years old in order for us to generate eligibility. or that campus has been modernized with state funds in the last 20 or 25 years. So for example, on the screen you'll see in Soto and in Almar, uh, those are two new uh, sites that are important. Okay. Does that mean we can't get a match for the field and for the auditorium? Um, for, uh, at, at present, not under, not under, moderniza not under modernization. So um, we're exploring the uh, options for us to file um, applications for new construction. And again, if uh, there's discussion in 2020 of a, of a new bond, the program details may change. But as of today, there's an opportunity to go back in time. And so, uh, you know, that's great. Those, that's I think those sites are probably not going to come online until the 2020s or the mid 2020s. But you know, so we're always going to be looking. Great. Um, this slide, uh, moving on from the elementary, shows uh, Midland High Schools um, with an overall eligibility that we're um, looking at about $52 million. This is our draft new construction eligibility um, for 2017-18. Uh, uh, it includes uh, a drawdown. We've already taken the grants out for the applications that we filed at Valencia and Aptos. This is sort of the remainder. Um, this eligibility is going to be good for the rest of the month. Um, as of the 1st of November, we're required to update the enrollment projection and the capacity comparison that I talked about earlier. And we'll be, we're working with staff to, to get uh, the enrollment information that the district took on CBED today, which I think was Wednesday of last week. There are several other programs that I mentioned that were part of um, Prop 51. Um, uh, Career Tech uh, is one of them. It provides $3 million for uh, new construction, uh, $1.5 million for uh, moder uh, modernization or renovation of existing facilities at comprehensive high schools. And there's the facility hardship program, which um, ad addresses sort of uh, uh, emergency needs, um, health and safety issues that affect students and staff at various sites. This is sort of the first of my bad news slides. <laughs> and the reason for that is um, Basically, from December of 1998, when um, uh, the, uh, the Prop 1A passed and, was, uh, and that, that uh, election was certified, to about December of 2008, the program moved along pretty swimmingly. We had some times where we were out of money, and applications would be submitted, and they would go on what's called an unfunded list. But uh, December of 2008 is basically when the state declared that there was a fiscal crisis. Uh, we probably all remember the Great Recession. <laughs> Um, from that point forward, the state stopped using a revolving fund to assist in making sure that the dollars and cents went out to school districts in a timely manner. Um, they, instead of using the AB 55 loans, which basically took um, Caltrans bonds and prison bonds and the redevelopment bonds and pooled them all together and lumped cash out to um, school districts as needed uh, and to 
and to those other agencies. Some of those agencies would get school bond money. This basically was all pooled together as a pooled money investment account. Um, they required, or the state required that school bonds be sold specifically for the projects for which they were um, being uh, granted money. That has slowed the process considerably. In, uh, in addition from you know, basically 2008 through um, 2016, we didn't have a bond pass. So there was no statewide bond until we got um, the voter initiative, Prop 51, um, on the ballot and passed in November of 16. There were several attempts uh, by the legislature to place them on the ballot, but they never really materialized. From currently, so from 2009 to today, we go through what's called the priorities and funding process. So we submit an application. It goes into that sort of, for lack of a better term, bin time at OPSC. When they get, when it gets to a point where it can be reviewed and approved by the state allocation board, the district then uh, is also, as an additional step, required to certify that they have the ability either to proceed with the project or that they've already proceeded with the project and can then um, request a fund release within 90 days. Um, it also limits the ability for the state allocation board and um, school districts to get money more than about twice a year, whereas before we could do it sort of on a monthly basis. Um, and because of some of these uh, issues, we have basically a $4.7 billion backlog in projects that have yet to be processed through to the state allocation board for approval. It's a little bit difficult to see. Um, I think uh, Joe handed out a slightly larger copy for you guys to review, but um, this is a cash flow sheet that that sort of outlines that $4.7 billion worth of projects. And the top line is um, when a project was submitted, actually received by the state for a review and approval. And then the bottom of the, pipe of the uh, bar chart is the date that our office believes that those, based on uh, empirical <laughs> evidence and, and track record of the state, when those projects will receive um, money from the, from the state. Uh, our projects were submitted in late August. And so we are unfortunately not anticipating any funds until July of 2028. And again, there are some, uh, a lot of this unfortunately is political. Um, the governor has not allowed, uh, um, or the governor has, has indicated that debt service payments on school facility bonds should be a smaller percentage of the, of the budget. And therefore, we really only sold about half of the $1.2 billion per year in school bonds that we would anticipate or would expect from his, the state's historical um, activity level. And with that, I can take questions. Okay, we don't have any speakers to this item, so we're gonna have, do you have a question? Jeff, no? Okay, Karen? So I just wanted to ask how we might be able to use the career and technical education part of the I don't know if it's, mod, it's new, what is it? It's new construct, what is it? Which one is it? <laughs> it's, its, own, it's its own pot of money. <laughs> okay, so, so in, in what way, maybe Joe, could, could we uh, you know, work with trying to get the career and technical education money for all of our high schools? So for our high schools, what we need to do is, uh, so we're working with school facility consultants for the next round of funding, both for uh, new construction or modernization and CTE and then also equipment. So there's two uh, buckets of CTE funding, one for the building or modernization or construction, and the second bucket is for equipment. So working with uh, Rob um, and our career tech education coordinator is looking at by high school, what is the program, uh, career tech ed program. Mm -hmm. So whether it's nursing or ag business or um, uh, body shop, is making sure what the needs are from a facility uh, program perspective, align that within our application, and then is there equipment necessary, and then making sure that, and it's a competitive process, and I, I, well, I'm not sure if we touched on that, but it's a very competitive process throughout the state for CTE dollars, so it's a grant, it's kind of like similar to a grant application. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that we have the program component, facilities, and or equipment, and so we're working on that right now for next year. Uh, so we can uh, uh, go after those CTE dollars. Yeah. Okay. So we're excited about that and that opportunity. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, we were successful, and I'm very excited to get uh, Aptos in Valencia and uh, getting that kind of checked off there. Um, so we're really excited. Wish we can get that money sooner uh, than later, but we definitely uh, are ready to go. One of the other pieces that we're working very hard uh, with staff is facility hardship. And um, 
as Kevin mentioned, 4.7, uh, you know, a bat backlog of other districts and their projects. Facility hardship, whether it's health uh, and safety or an impact to um, our students, is we have the ability um, kind of like to cut in line um, if we're able to prove that there is an, uh, a need uh, when it impacts uh, health and safety. So we're also pursuing that as well, um, whether it's our plumbing, um, uh, sewer, um, seismic, other components like that. So we're also looking at water towers, water, et cetera. So. Mm, there you go. Yeah. Do we have any other questions from the board? Kim? So um, I've been waiting and waiting for the state to release this money because I had, I knew that we could, I thought we could get up to about 49% reimbursement. So we've, we went out for a $150 million bond. We've spent two thirds of it already. So I understand we're going backwards and taking a look. Um, but so d are you telling me we only have two projects right now that are in the pipeline? out of the two thirds of the bond money that's already been spent? All right, so kind of just to re-explain is the, the current slide up there and you have in your portfolio there, is this is what each site is eligible in, in our modernization eligibility mm -hmm. throughout our district. The way the program works is you see the district match, 40% uh, share. Mm -hmm. to qualify for the state 60% share. And so districts throughout California have to put in a percentage to qualify or obtain the funding from Prop, Prop 51. This is the eligibility throughout our district. So what we need to do as a district is look and how I can, uh, with Kevin and our facilities team, is align our financial resources, whether it's a bond program, developer fees, uh, other facilities funding, and how do I uh, come together with the district match so I can get that reimbursement or the state match with it? And so that's the, the, the role and the goal of modernization eligibility. And I hope I explained that. Um, it's still a little confusing, but let me ask another question. What does total grants mean? Like when it says Alianza 857, like what does that mean? The, the way that the state uh, approaches uh, the modernization eligibility is it's, it's the number of classrooms that are over 25 or 20 years old, and then there's an additional application of the number of students that are attending. So, and it really comes okay. down to, if we have a, uh, if we have a, uh, say we have a, a 600 capacity school that is really only being attended by say 325 students, the state will only give us 325 students worth of eligibility, or worth of funding to modernize that campus rather than the, the full amount. It's not necessarily the way that I would prefer that they did it, but so, up on this particular chart, um, total grants is really the total number of students at each of the sites that is being represented by the dollars. Got it, and that makes better sense. So um, if there's a $4.7 million backlog, and that's projects that have come forward in that eight-year drought period too and been holding, so that only leaves $2.3 billion for the remainder of the projects that have happened since the issuance in, right, 2016. Yeah, and, and really the game at the moment is to get modernization projects submitted, and that's what we're working with staff to accomplish. Okay. Yeah, so the, the timeline that we're, kind of the pressure that we're under now is to get our applications in and get in line. Um, when the funding comes is another question, but we need to get in line first, and that's what we're pushing very hard to do. And do we have any idea when, when the funding will come? I mean, has any funding been released, actually? Because I had heard that, I mean, there's so many districts waiting and waiting. So if we look at, uh, and I'm really bad with colors, I think it's orange. Yeah. <laughs> so the 302 and the 253, that is, that's basically the amount of projects that have been apportioned. They have received their dollars from the state, from Prop 51. It's going very, very slowly. Um, uh, a change in administration come January may change that, um, but at, at the same time, uh, calls to your uh, Sacramento representatives saying, hey, what's going on with the fact that that we're looking at uh, basically a 10-year wait to get mm -hmm. money that the voters have approved in 2016. Um, seems like a long time to wait. When, when we um, championed this bond program, we were really hoping that the governor would, 
or somebody would push through a bond program so that we could get matching dollars for our shovel ready projects and we, it was it was a huge disappointment that it took so long to even get this prop 51 passed so um, I think it would behoove all of us to contact our electeds and um, try to get some of this unlocked faster I mean I've talked to them also but I think we're we are all waiting for the administration to change so we'll see how far we can get but um, yeah the, 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 the we need help getting as much money as possible that we're eligible for mm -hmm. so thank you and Jeff well actually Kim said it we're looking at not getting our money until 2028 20, 10 years from now mm -hmm. so we're, we're running up these bills and no one's paying it so I, I think Kim brings up a great a great point we need to call people in Sacramento that we may have connections to and say you know turn the faucet on that's all I have but again that the number I heard was 2028 when money is being released 10 years from now uh, yeah July 2028 is our projection for a project <laughs> you're very <laughs> specific about that month okay excuse me Willie uh, <coughs> um, measure measure L we um, knew there was there was uh, three hundred million dollars of need, and we uh, passed the passed the bond in one hundred and fifty million. So that other one hundred and fifty need need about five or six years ago was basically there still yet. Ap Aptos High School, the uh, buildings in the back need to get uh, fixed. I'm not sure if they've already been fixed, but. Isn't that a list of things that we can submit almost right away to get worked on? So it's uh, funded? So to your first part, um, yes, there is still a larger need than the 150 million within previous of what Measure J completed, now Measure L and potential future bond. Um, we need to complete a facilities master plan and analysis um, what our program need is based on enrollment and the programs that we're doing as a district. So that is something we have to do down the road. Um, the, the way Prop 51 is set up and other facilities funding is current past or current funded projects or completed. And so that's what we're working on right now to try to go back in time and capture all the funding on the eligibility that um, the sites qualify for that you have on the map and making sure that we do that and also current projects. Any potential projects within the third issuance of our current bond program is making sure it aligns within the various buckets of funding. And so we're also reviewing that piece right now. Is it easier to get uh, modernization money than uh, construction money? At the moment, I'm gonna suggest that we focus our efforts. Uh, we, we will be filing as soon as applications are ready to go, but the focus, I think, from a district perspective will be on modernization because there is still authorization from Prop 51 in modernization, whereas the state has indicated that they've received Good. applications that Good. need a okay. new construction. And um, I had this great question. I forgot what it was. You always have Any other comments, questions? Uh, Willie? So, uh, so, so I think we, we ought to uh, activate our site and facilities committee immediately to get a, get a handle on our needs now and our future needs as, uh, as to the enrollments and where they are and how to, how to plan for future uh, uh, school sites and uh, we uh, talked about this under housing uh, measure H and and all of those things add together so so I think that we need to um, um, re er, reform that committee and uh, let's start looking so and thank you both all right, so we're, that was a report and discussion item. So now we're moving to item 10.0. I am looking for a motion to approve the consent agenda items. So you're making a motion, Karen? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can make it. Mm -hmm. Okay, can we get a second? Okay, well. I, I just wanted to say I really felt like I'm, I told him I was going to say this too. 
but um, about the the, um, the gratitude for the donation from the Michoacana Paleteria y Nieveria, which is mm -hmm. means um, popsicle and ice cream. That's what it means. Um, my next door neighbor that lives right next door to me, his name is Cecilio Aguilera, and he is the one that creates the popsicles. He creates the popsicles. And <laughs> since they moved to their new location in Freedom, he has created 37 new flavors of popsicles, 37 flavors. And his popsicles, are, I mean, incredible. They're not popsicles like you've ever eaten in your whole life. I mean, you've never eaten popsicles like his really? ever, never. So I'm asking all of you, if you haven't gone to this ice cream place, you all, every single one of you has to go because the ice creams that you eat there, many of them are from fruits from Mexico or they're from, I mean, they make them out of, and they make them with the real, you know, they have coconut, ice cream with coconut in it. It has coconut in it. You know what I'm saying? Or they have, I mean, just, I, I just can't tell you. They have, you know, <coughs> cheese ice cream that has cheese in it, whatever. <laughs> but I'm just saying, uh, uh, but corn ice cream that has corn in it, but whatever. Actually, has <laughs> it has, but, um, and, and the popsicles are incredible. So I just, I just want to tell you that you all need to go there. It's on and my freedom? next door neighbor, what? It's it's the first shopping center on Freedom, back where the campus can be cut. You used to be, um, you know, it has the um, factory to you like there. Cassidy. Yeah, like Cassidy. Oh, I don't know about Cassidy's. I don't eat there. But I'm just saying, <laughs> it's got. <laughs> La Princesa. Oh, it's got La, it's got La Princesa there. Yeah, it's got La Princesa okay, and factory to you. You know that clothing place factory. It's it's where that is. It's in there. So he d he donated a lot of popsicles to our saying. district. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So That's what the gratitude special. is. That's yeah. the gratitude. He donated yeah. 60 popsicles of all different flavors, I'm sure. Uh, did <laughs> any of you eat those popsicles? Any of you here? <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. All right. Um, under item 10.3, I do want to make a quick comment. So I'm just really happy to see that we're working Finally, on our EL yeah, master plan, exactly. uh, with a significant focus on professional and coaching learning um, for our PBUS staff. Maria, and so with that, oh, I'm sorry. Under under item uh, 10.9, if I can make a comment, since we're making comments. Sure. Um, not all change orders result in added money, so I, so I just want to point this out. There. Are uh, under under item 10.9, there was one change order for 10,000, and then there was one for uh, credit of uh, $7,989. So, not all change orders are negative. Are, are what? Right. Negative. Oh, uh huh. Okay. Right. Thank Some you. Can that's, save money. that's all. We do. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Six zero one, and so um, now we're going back to action on closed session. So under item two point one, I move to approve the certificate report as presented by the district administration. <coughs> Second. Oh. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Six zero one. Under item 2.2, .2, I move to approve the classified report as presented by the district administration. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries 601. And under item 2.4, uh, the board approved with a 601 uh, vote to ratify a workers' compensation claim for number 504582. And under item 2.5, the board approved a final settlement agreement and release for one special education student, also with a 601 vote. And with that, we adjourn tonight's meeting at 8.44. That's pretty darn early. <laughs> 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 woo! Wow. That is, woo! How